We're talking all things silver today with Steve Penny. He is the publisher of the Silver Chartist Report. Steve, welcome to the show. You bet, David. Thank you so much. I've been following you guys for a long time. First time guest, but a long time listener. So it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. That's, that's amazing. Thank you for being here. And I followed you on Twitter. You've got some amazing posts. And we'll be talking about some of your research today. Focusing on silver, I know you cover the uranium and gold markets as well. But today, primarily, we'll be talking about silver and uh, your outlook for the metal. Silver has had uh, a rough year, to say the least. A lot of people expected it to go higher for a variety of reasons. One of the interesting things I've noticed this year, well, myself and uh, other analysts I've spoken to, is that silver has diverged from the gold price. Historically, they've moved in tandem. Silver has had a higher beta to gold. But this year, for some reason, uh, if, if you look at the two variables next to each other, they don't seem to be moving in the same direction all the time. Why is that? Well, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would not necessarily agree with that over the long term. You, you could certainly, that's certainly a true statement over the last uh, few months. But if you look at the gold to silver ratio, something I track very closely, Going back to March of 2020, that ratio had reached an, an extreme that's never been seen before, about 130 to 1. And then very quickly, that ratio compressed down to about 65 to 1 in August of last year. So that, that ratio had moved really far, really fast. So I think what we're seeing here is just kind of a little bit of a backing and filling in that ratio, where we said, uh, last I checked, somewhere around uh, 75 to 1 or so. But I, I do think that silver will continue to move in the same direction as gold. and. Uh, outperform gold as the bull market resumes. Okay. And let's talk about the gold-silver ratio now. So as you said, historic levels uh, never before seen before. We're, we've come back down since, uh, since you know, 120, 130. Historically, it's hovered around, I would say, what, 50? Now we're still higher than that. What, what's, what's, uh, what's your outlook for the gold-silver ratio? Where should it be, according to your analysis? Sure. Well, well there's a couple of answers to that. You can look at... Um, mining output. And uh, roughly, it's a roughly a nine to one ratio where silver is pulled out of the ground roughly nine times uh, in greater abundance than gold. So that's one ratio you could look at. You could look at a long term historical ratio, and that's roughly 15 to one. And uh, 15 to one is interesting to me because that's typically where bull markets peak. So back in 1980, at the peak of that bull run, uh, the price of gold was roughly 15 times that of silver. So I think in the fullness of time, in the next few years, we're very likely to see that ratio revisited 15 to 1. Of course, that, that's going to take some time because we're sitting at roughly 75 to 1 now. But that would mean that silver outperforms gold by roughly a factor of five over the next few years. And I think that's a very logical uh, path forward. A decline of the gold-silver ratio down to 15 to 1 could imply one of two things. Either silver skyrockets to the moon or gold collapses, <laughs> which right. is more likely. Well, I, I don't think gold is going to collapse. I think we've already seen uh, most of the selling here. I'm not, I'm not necessarily calling a bottom, but I think we're much closer to a bottom than a top in the metals. And um, you know, like I said, I think silver is going to outperform going forward, but I also think gold will do very well. Okay. And let's talk about the industrial component of silver. So let's uh, circle back to the fundamentals now. What do mm -hmm. you think of the core drivers right now? Well, for the silver price... You mentioned industrial demand. That, that's a tailwind. Industrial uses for silver are only increasing, especially with uh, electrical vehicles, solar panels, you name it. There's a lot of things, industrial uses for silver. But that's not my primary investment thesis. And that's re the primary investment thesis is based on retail investment demand. Um, if just a small number of general investors say, hey, I want to have exposure to just some silver, there's just not simply enough at, at today's prices. And historically, that's what drives you know the kind of prices silver investors are looking for, you know, north of fifty dollars. And okay, um, so you know, I think it's that th that is coming. We're just waiting for a catalyst. Well, silver investors might be wondering. We've had a number of industrial catalysts this year: the infrastructure bill, the mm -hmm. uh, long-term greenification of our economy that requires silver in a lot of different uh, applications, industrial applications. So why hasn't the silver price moved this year? Well, like I said, the industrial demand. It, that's a tailwind, but what we need to really see the price move is uh, more generalist investors come in, retail demand. And what we just haven't quite seen that yet. We do see have the Wall Street silver crowd, and there's a constant bid for silver, uh, physical silver, but we're not seeing the generalist investors shift in mass. Um, they're still into um, you know, what I call the bubble assets, you know, general equities and things like that. But at some point, they're going to shift. Value investors are going to shift over towards silver, and that's when we're going to see the really explosive moves higher, in my opinion. So, well, we did see the silver squeeze earlier this year uh, from the Wall Street silver crowd. Right. That wasn't enough, you're saying? Well, uh, 
it, it was enough, but it, it's still a smaller subset of the general investment crowd. Like you're not seeing silver talked about on Fox Business or CNBC or anything like that. Um, people are going where in, uh, you know, they're chasing momentum. And right now that's in stocks, tech stocks and other assets. But at some point that's going to shift. And one, one thing I, one metric I like to track is the Dow gold ratio and the Dow to silver ratio. And we, we need to see the metals start to outperform stocks. And as that starts to happen, you know, that's going to attract a lot of those generalist investors to take their chips off the table in these overvalued assets and cycle into things like silver and uranium and gold. Okay. Isn't that kind of a chicken and an egg problem now, Steve? I mean, these mainstream media outlets that you mentioned, Fox Business, CNN, CNBC, they're not going to talk about silver or gold for that matter until the price moves. I remember mainstream right. coverage of gold, um, it hit a peak last summer when, when gold also, no pun intended, hit a peak. Right. But uh, but it doesn't seem like they were covering it before when there was no price action. So, yes, we do need to see more mainstream adoption. But mainstream adoption is going to happen at these lower, low volatility price environments. What do you think? Yeah, that's true. And it's important to know, especially with silver, um, the price is set by supply and demand of paper contracts set on the commodities exchange or the COMEX. And historically, the commitment of traders report is a good indicator, not necessarily of nailing the bottom, but of when a bottom is close. And what's interesting is that commitment of traders support in silver has greatly improved over this last few weeks. So we're seeing the banks starting to cover their short positions and we see smart money posturing for a, uh, or positioning for you know, the, the next turn in silver. And you know, I, I think uh, that, that's gonna be a big catalyst too when, uh, when, when the banks start buying. Why do the banks have short positions to begin with? Well, that's a really good question. Um, if you ask them, they'll say it's you know, to hedge existing longs and for their clients. But um, you know, I'm not one of these people who blames every downtick on manipulation, but I think there's a very good case to be made that silver is uh, likely the most manipulated metal on the planet. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you mean by that? How is it being manipulated? Well, on the, on the COMEX, um, you can see that uh, large sell orders come through at very illiquid times, and that's not the price, that's not the behavior of traders who would be looking to maximize profits. Okay. So can you elaborate on that? They're, they're, they're doing what exactly? So um, let's see, I'm trying to think of the most recent example. Like I said, I don't blame every downtick on manipulation. I understand. And, uh, you know, yeah, and I, I didn't intend to open up a can of worms. But if you, if you go back, uh, let's see, a few weeks ago, there was a really uh, sharp sell-off in gold, something like $80, $90. I, I can't remember the exact date. And th that happened at a very illiquid trading time. You know, in, in the middle of the night before the, the uh, New York traders are active, if, if you're a trader looking to get rid of your long positions, that's not how you would get rid of those. You would want to sell gradually into, into, um, you know, into strength or into more liquid markets. Um, that, that's just one example of how banks can potentially manipulate the paper price lower. Well, well Steve, I mean, that, maybe that just speaks to the illiquidity of the silver market and the paper contracts and the COMEX altogether. I mean, that, isn't that the same argument as saying, well, a penny stock is being moved dramatically by well, you know, one lot, one what one, one seller selling uh selling a bunch of lots uh, right. overnight uh, but i mean he may or may not necessarily be manipulating the market he's just dumping his positions right but it's an illiquid market for that penny stock and so therefore it's moved a lot well if you let's let's use that analogy let's say you owned a penny stock you wanted to sell it and you know it trades on very thin volume i mean are you going to try and sell that in off market hours um when you know there's no buyers there no you're going to scale out slowly in the most liquid hours you're not just going to dump it all at once because you know you're not going to get the best price. And I think that's a, that's a great analogy for what we see in the silver market frequently. Okay. So let's go back to the price now. So the price, uh, the price action we've seen over the last couple of months has been, has been, if I can characterize it as being stale, that could, uh, <laughs> I would use that word, but uh, I'd like to get your opinion on how it's oh, yeah. performed thus far according to your expectations as a, yeah, as a silver and, analyst. Yeah. And, and, and saying stale, I think that's putting it kindly. Let's just say it's been terrible. It's been just <laughs> flat out ugly. I mean, if you told me back in August of 2020 that we'd be see here in September of 2021 with a 21 handle in silver, um, you know, most people wouldn't believe you. Um, almost everything is going up except for you know <laughs> silver and the things that should be going up in this environment. So it's extremely frustrating, and I sympathize with that. But you know, I, I'm a contrarian investor, and as a contrarian investor, I like this price action because it gives us time to accumulate. It gives our members a time to accumulate at much more favorable prices, and um, you know. I if history is any guide, th this is not going to last. Silver and gold have a long track record of thriving and prospering in this exact environment that we're seeing right now. Sure, there, there are still some short-term headwinds as the Fed continues to talk about taper, 
uh, normalization of interest rates in 2022, those are short-term he- headwinds. But from a longer, bigger term or macro perspective, we, we know that's not sustainable. Um, silver and gold always do a full accounting for the expansion of debt-based fiat currency. And I don't think this time will be any different. If I were new to the market, if I were not yet invested in silver, would you recommend me getting in right now? Or do you think I should wait? Oh, absolutely. I, I love that question, David, because a lot of people maybe learn about the silver space for the first time and their eyes are open. They realize that you know stock market's a bubble or they come to these conclusions and then they sell everything and pile all in. And I, I don't think that's the, a wise move. I think everyone needs to have a plan. And first of all, I think people should decide Hey, I'm new to this space. How much of my portfolio do I want to even allocate to this sector? That's the first question. And then from there, have a plan to accumulate. There's no right or wrong answer, but you could dollar cost average. You could simply wait for a technical reversal. There's nothing wrong with that. Or you could scale in on weakness. But um, having a plan is the most important thing. But I certainly wouldn't just, you know, hey, I'm new to the sector, put all my money in right now. I don't think that's the wisest way to do it. And so if I were to invest in silver right now, let's say, what are some of the instruments I could use? What would you recommend me do? Buy physical, buy the paper markets, buy ETFs? Sure. Yeah, I, I love that do? question. So I'm a big ad- advocate for owning physical metal stored outside of the banking system first. I like to say, build your moat before your castle. I think of physical metals as my defense, and then the mining stocks as my offense. And there's different ways to invest in the mining sector. Uh, some are a little bit more high risk, high reward, if you know what you're doing, or you have some guidance. Um, but a simple way to do is just to buy the ETF. That's for someone who doesn't want to do any uh, due diligence on individual stocks, there's some, sure. there's some okay ETFs out there, but a well-selected basket of indiv- individual mining stocks would outperform in my opinion. Okay. Interesting. And again, if I, were a generalist, if I were a generalist investor who has no experience in the silver market, I may say to you, Steve, I've just t- taken a look at the long-term chart of silver over the last 40 years or so, and it has not even breached its 1980 peaks yet. So I mean, this long-term chart, I'm a long-term investor, I'll say to you, Steve, and this long-term chart doesn't really look appealing to me. What's going to be different this time? What's going to be different in this next 40-year cycle? Yeah. So the person who says that this doesn't look appealing to me, as a contrarian, this does look appealing to me. You just made a really good point. Silver still hasn't even surpassed its 1980 high. And I think that's the only commodity on planet Earth that you can say that about. Silver reached about $50 in 1980. And here we are at 21. So not only are we not above that 1980 high, we're less than half. So, I mean, unless this is some kind of anomaly where this time is different, um, you know, silver's got much more upside and very little downside compared to any other asset than I can think of. Okay. Now let's talk about this $50 silver price. I'm going to give you a hypothetical scenario now. Okay. I'm going to say to you, Steve, we're talking about Catalyst now. We're, I'm not, I'll say to you, Steve, next year, silver needs to go to $50. What would you say the Catalyst has to be for $50 to happen in one year's time? So basically double in a year. Okay. Um, well, picking catalysts is tough because there's a million potential catalysts out there and trying to nail it down to one. But he, here's one scenario that I think is likely. Uh, I, I try and avoid terms like using words like uh, crash and collapse and things like that. But let's just say the stock market, I think, is due for a 20% pullback. A lot of people right. might call that a crash. I think if we saw a 20% pullback in the stock market, especially if it happened in a short period of time, that's going to get rid of any taper talk. They're going to stop talking about tightening uh, interest rates over the, you know, 2022, and they would probably reverse course and have more monetary stimulus. Just a 20% pullback in stock market. That, that could be a significant catalyst for the metals. So that, that's one potential scenario I'm looking at here over the intermediate term. What's the relationship between monetary stimulus and the price of the metals? Absolutely. Yeah. Especially silver. Silver responds, you know, uh, has a direct correlation to um, Fed monetary policy. Easy Fed monetary policy typically results in uh, uptrending prices for the metals. It's as simple as that. Can you explain why? I mean, what's the what, what's the uh, what's the connection here? So you've got a bunch of uh, you've got the expansion of the money supply mm-hmm. by the central banks. You've got presumably also a lowering of the interest rates because they they need to lower interest rates. That that's the mechanism with which they 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 purchase bonds through the open markets, and so you've got. Uh, more money supply, lower interest rates. How does that feed into higher silver prices? Sure. So two answers to that. First, silver and gold, put simply, are money. They're, they're, they're money for, they've been money for thousands of years. And when currency is debased, people look for to preserve their purchasing power. And silver and gold have historically done that role. So when they're debasing the currency, that makes silver and gold uh, an attractive alternative. And then second, you met, mentioned interest rates. You know, A lot of people right now put their savings in the bank to earn an interest rate. Well, if the rate of inflation is higher than the 
interest you're getting by keeping your currency in a, in a bank, well, that, you're, you're losing purchasing power, which again, makes silver and gold a more attractive alternative, especially to, to big investors. Okay. Uh, I've heard an argument from another analyst talking about silver. Now, I'll just ask you to agree or disagree with this statement sure. here. Now, he said that silver, like you said, used to be a form of money for many, many generations. Mm -hmm. It may no longer serve that purpose going forward because what silver has done in the past was it's basically uh, provided smaller units of account for gold. Like if you, you wouldn't go to, a, go to a baker and buy your bread with an ounce of gold, with a, with, a, with a small gold coin. But you might do that with silver coins, for example. So it was smaller units of account for gold. Now what we have, we have gold uh, blockchain. We have uh, gold on, uh, we have cryptos coming out based on gold. That has basically infinite divisibility. And so you can pay for your piece of bread using you, small, small fractions of that gold blockchain. And so the purpose of silver is no longer is no longer there in the future. How would you respond to that? Yeah, the, you're you're about the fourth person to ask me that in the last handful of days, and I believe you're <laughs> you're referring to Lobo Tigre. I actually had the pleasure to meet him in person this past weekend, yeah. and uh, Lobo is someone I look up to a lot. He's uh, an independent thinker, and I really respect his thoughts. Um, I'm not willing to say I, I fully agree with that right now. I mean, uh, the last several thousand years are filled with failed attempts to replace silver and gold as money. And uh, nothing has been able to replace it yet. Now, could blockchain take some of uh, the monetary use away from silver? Uh, that remains to be seen. But as far as the blockchain uses for gold, there's also plenty of blockchain uh, applications coming to silver as well. Um, so I think I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm willing to buy into that argument yet, though. Um, I, I think it's a point worth considering. I, I respect okay. Lobo's thoughts on that. Let's close on your forecast for the silver price. So we, I gave you a hypothetical $50 scenario. Let's talk about your more realistic base case for where uh, silver could end up by this year, the end of the year. Okay. So realistic forecast for this year, I'm going to say $400. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> well, I, I, I like to say I, de I deal in probabilities, not predictions. So okay. I think we're very close to a bottom here. There, is, there still is some downside risk to potentially $18 or $19 silver. I'm not saying that's a probability, but it, it's, it's, it's a high enough probability that we should be mentally prepared for it. The big number to watch is $30. I think everyone knows that who's been watching the, the silver price for any length of time. Once we get above 30, I think we do get to $50 fairly quick, probably within a quarter or two, because there's not much resistance between $30 and $50 silver. So um, I'll say once we get through 30, I think 50 comes pretty quick. Probably not in 2021, but perhaps in the first half of 2022. Yeah, I've heard that before. So you're basically giving a pretty tight range from now until the end of the year, which is which is fair. Do you think uh, the probabilities uh, are uh, ho more highly weighted on the downside or the upside from here? We're at twenty two dollars today. Yes. Yeah, I think downside risk is minimal relative to upside potential for anyone with a one to three year time horizon. Downside okay. risk is minimal. If you've got a one to three year time horizon, I think we're squarely in the accumulation zone. Nailing the exact bottom is very difficult. I mean, very few. And nobody yes, can do that consistently, but yes. we can say, hey, we're, we're getting close here. All the, the, the fundamentals, um, the technicals are all starting to line up that we're getting close to a bottom here. And I think this is a great time to start scaling in if you've got that risk tolerance and time horizon. So more likely than not, we'll hover between the 22 and $30 range by the end of the year. I think so. Yeah. There's been a lot of technical damage inflicted over this past few weeks. So that's going to take a little bit of time to repair. All right, Steve. Pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome to Kitco, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.